All right, everybody, welcome back to the podcast edition for the matchups of the week. Um, really quickly, guys, um, there's going to be a little bit of a surprise. Um, tonight at Johnny's house, there's going to be an extra podcast, so you get two podcasts in one day. There, we're going to have a little bit of a debate, something we did last season. I'm going to have a set of questions. That stuff will be answered, but right now, matchups of the week. Hopefully, this gets out by 3 o'clock at the latest. So, let's get into it. So, the first matchup, believe it or not, uh, somebody in this matchup might have a chance. It's very, very slim, but they might have a chance to be in first place in their division. I'm talking about Lewis, who is riding a two-game winning streak, taking on someone searching for his first one of the season, and Paul. Well, first and foremost, I'm going to break down keys of victory this time rather than going up by matchups because people just kind of are ridiculous and they put their best players at flex just to show off that they have a good flex, but it makes no sense. Bottom line is um, we have a different constructed team here as well. Let's go at the Paul side of things first and then I'll get into Lewis's side and then I'll see what has to counteract. So for Paul's team... You know, Eli Manning at Green Bay, it doesn't look like Sam Shields is going to suit up. That's bad news for the Green Bay Packers because I do think that this offense, you're, you're, they're not going to do what they did last week. I think they played very scared. I think Eli Manning finishes within the top 10 for quarterbacks this week and look for Odell Beckham also to have a good game. Well, a newly acquired Amari Cooper um, against San Diego without Jason Verrett. Casey Hayward has played very well. But I doubt he shadows one guy. I don't think that's going to be the game plan with San Diego. They're just going to have to take a bullet on either Crabtree or Cooper. Bold prediction here. Cooper gets his first touchdown. Why? I know it's been a while. And now that he's on a different team, wouldn't be surprised if he scores for somebody else and not Rob Coffey. So I like a touchdown for Cooper. Alshon Jeffrey, I'm not big on. He's hurt yet again. He always has these nagging injuries. And when he suits up, he's like 11 points at best. I had him the same to- uh, around the same time where he had injuries like this. and It's just not looking good. And Brian Hoyer is going to look to his check down options in Royal and Zach Miller. Charles Sims? Um, also newly acquired for this team, thanks to the coffee deal. If he suits up against the Carolina Panthers, I actually think this is a good spot for Charles Sims. Um, he's actually produced very well. I think he finds the consistent RB2 value. He's projected at 12. I'd say that's probably what he's going to hit. LeGarrette Blunt. well, now with Brady back into the picture, you can't, you don't know. It's on the road. Uh, the angry Tom Brady narrative is being played here. I get that. But I'll say that Blunt doesn't quite hit the projection of 15. And if he does, whatever. I think he gets like 13 at 12, make it like 60 rushing yards and a touch. So Ebron is hurt, so now you're streaming Jesse James. It's not a bad streamer against the Jets, but Jesse James is that tight end who's only going to get 20 yards and you got to hope for a touchdown. And believe it or not, I don't see that, so I don't like Jesse James. Stephon Diggs and Jalen Richard. Now, it's funny. I told Paul to sell Stephon Diggs' eye. It's like he went on vacation, comes back to Paul's team. Um, I know Stephon Diggs is the number one for Minnesota. I, I get that, but I don't see him being very consistent. Uh, he, to me, still... This happened last year with Stephon Diggs. This is what I was worried about. He shows up for like two or three games and then kind of disappears. Diggs, to me, is a wide receiver three in a flex spot value. But against the Houston Texans, this isn't isn't the a tough matchup. I don't know how I feel about Stephon Diggs, to be honest. I'm That's a big question mark for me, so I can't give you a prediction on that. Jalen Richard, however, well, if Latavius Murray is unable to go, this is the only reason I think why Paul traded for Latavius Murray, even though it was a terrible trade. Uh, Jalen Richard could... I, I still think if, if Murray's out, it's going to be Washington Richard split. But I don't think any of these guys have any touchdown upside at all. It's going to be that fullback, Owale, or I don't know how you say his name again. I just think that if Richard has to hit that 10 points projection, that means return yards and outproducing DeAndre Washington, and you're not hoping on a touchdown. I think Richard hits 7 or 8 points. 
most. He would have to break a really big run against San Diego, which is possible. But I do think that Jack Del Rio is going to feature DeAndre Washington more than he is Jalen Richard. And no kicker and no defense. So Paul's key to victory here. Eli, Eli Manning has to has to has to perform. Bottom line. Uh, so that's the number one case. Amari Cooper has has to has to hit. I only feel op- optimistic about maybe four guys. If you want to throw in Charles Sims, and the other guys are kind of wild cards at this point. Over to the other side of the ball, we have Lewis, who for some odd reason. Uh, there's a lot of guys who, in my personal opinion, deserve a lot better projection uh, points than what he's getting right now. It's, it's ridiculous. So we got Aaron Rodgers, Tavon Austin, Sammy Coates, Jarek McKinnon, Carlos Hyde, Zach Miller, Fozzie Whitaker, Chris Hogan, Graham Gano, Carolina D. Okay. Well, Giants secondary is getting hurt, so Aaron Rodgers has a chance to go off. Probably is going to happen. I said in the Power Rankings podcast, if you ever drafted Tavon Austin and you plan on keeping Tavon Austin, you just have to plug him in every week and hope for the best. And I think with bye weeks and Des Bryant uh, not available, <laughs> sadly, he's projected the highest uh, for the receivers this week. But that's the thing. If Tavon Austin hits... He's getting in the high teens, like something like 16 to 17. I know one year he had like a 40-point uh, outburst. Um, but you never know with him. I, I can't predict Tavon Austin. I, the rule for Tavon Austin, if you have him, play him every week and just hopefully that everything else hits. Sammy Coates. This is a guy I could definitely see getting his first touchdown on the season against the Jets secondary that's been just depleted. Darrell Revis is no longer guarding number ones anymore. He's, he's just old. This is a Brown game, but this is also a Sammy Coates uh, bomb. I do think that he will find Pater in this one. This is a guy I like. I think this is the biggest difference maker in picking the winner in this division is the RBs. Jarek McKinnon and, and Carlos Hyde. Hyde I do like as an RB. Not against this matchup. However, with Drew Stanton controlling the ball, there could be... A lot of three and outs for them. Hyde has been pretty good this season. I'd say something around 40 yards and maybe a touch for worst case scenario, which would make him outperform his 10-point projection. Jarek McKinnon, uh, I really liked what I saw against the New York Giants. Really liked what I saw against the New York Giants. I think these the Vikings kind of have to ride him and give him breathers for Matt Asiata. Uh, also, but this, this could be a big Jerick McKinnon game. I'm going to say that McKinnon gets over that 10-point projection, and I wouldn't be bullish on to say 18-20. to 20. So if Zach Miller plays, this is now two weeks in a row where he's caught a touchdown out of Brian Hoyer. I, I like this chemistry a lot. It's, it's, it's a guy he's going to look to. And if Alshon Jeffrey is used as a decoy, that takes away Vontae Davis, which means Zach Miller might have a field day, as well as Eddie Roy. The Bears actually... If for those of you who do DFS, like stacking bears might be the way to go. I see Miller finding the end zone. I'll say 45 yards and a touchdown. And if you're lucky, you could get a second one. I really like Zach Miller this week. Fozzie Whitaker. Uh, I don't know what to say about him. Tampa Bay Buccaneers are not a great defense. But can he outperform that seven-point projection right there? I'll say so. 10-11 to 11 for Whitaker. Chris Hogan... Th- this is what you waited to see out of this guy. How is he going to be used with Tom Brady? It's against the Cleveland Browns. Chris Hogan actually is not like Edelman and Amendola, where all he does is go over the middle of the field. He's going to probably be treated as their vertical threat. We don't really think of white receivers like that, but if Tom Brady is to go off, I'd say that Hogan has a great possibility to get to the score. This could be a very dfs uh explosion lineup for Lewis this week. I really can actually see that. It, it wouldn't surprise me if that hit. And then uh, that, having three wins in a row, that's the narrative here. I'm picking Lewis in this game. Okay, so our next matchup of the week. Yo, I got a joke for you. Got a really bad joke for you, okay? You want to hear this shit? What do Rob Curfew and Odell Beckham have in common? Anybody? 
Anybody? They're not having fun anymore. <laughs> oh, oh uh, anyway. So, Rob Coffey, guy who went to the championship last year, sitting at 1-3 and three against a man who's had somewhat of a rivalry and has had somewhat of a pessimistic view on Coffey's team. Well, the make or break here, we got Allen going 0-4. Yeah. All right, so taking on Coffee Now, this is a make-or-break game, I think, for both. Coffee gets Tom Brady back. I'm going to start with the Coffee side of the ball and then go to Allen's. Biggest biggest news here is that Tom Brady comes back for Rob Coffee's team. This is a guy who always hits mid-20s at least. And against the Cleveland Browns. Uh... Buy in. I'll buy in on Tom Brady, but I'm really gonna buy in on Odell Beckham. I'm not. I'm not gonna like get off of the ship and say, eh, "Yeah, I'm off." It, some tells me that this dude is going to have a game. If the New York Giants want to keep Odell Beckham rostered after this, this was the worst temper tantrum. Now he's going out to the media saying he's not having fun anymore. One of two things: you either get rid of McAdoo. Now I know it's very premature to do that only four games into the season, or it's Beckham. McAdoo's stupid play call, like, I, the Giants want Odell Beckham in this situation. Give me Odell Beckham against Demarius Randall and Coffee. two touchdowns for Odell Beckham. Like, I know you're, but he needs to get one, no, 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 no. Two touchdowns for Odell Beckham, book it. Uh, John Brown, great to see him last week, but now with Drew Stan. Uh, I don't know. <sighs> If John Brown is to do anything, I feel like the explosion won't be there with Drew Stanton. Well, then again, it could be. I can't give you an I can't give you an optimistic and I can't give you a pessimistic prediction. So John Brown to me is a very, very big wild card in this matchup. Devonta Freeman and Isaiah Crowell. I actually do like Devonta Freeman this week. Not so much though, but I do think that he outperforms the ten point projection. I'll say Freeman gets around fifteen to sixteen points this week. So if there's one guy that the uh, New England Patriots are going to take away, it's probably going to be Isaiah Crowell, or because I don't know if it'll necessarily be Terrell Pryor. But I, do, I don't see Cro- <clears throat> excuse me, I do not see Isaiah Crowell <clears throat> having a big game. Uh, I just don't see that this week. I actually think <clears throat> Duke Johnson. I actually think this could be a Duke Johnson week, to be honest. So the next guy out is another guy that Rob just got reunited with, and that's Rob Gronkowski, saying that he's not 100% healthy. But with Tom Brady on the field, I'll say Rob Gronkowski finds the end zone. I don't think the yardage will be there, though. I'll say Rob Gronkowski gets three catches, 40 yards, and a touch. Adam Humphreys and Kenny Britt are bi-week fillers. So <clears throat> obviously you're not confident starting either one of these guys. I mean, that goes without saying. But both of these are kind of like flory, flory guys. Kenny Britt, I'm not huge on. So I, I like Humphreys better than Britt. Um, great, very good uh, pickup in uh, the defensive category. Wait for it. Los Angeles. All right, so Los Angeles as the defensive side of the ball. I guess the Buffalo Bills, they're at home. Defense is dialing up a lot of heat right now. So keep rolling with them. <clears throat> Keys to victory for Rob Coffey. Odo Beckham needs that two touchdown game. Well, he just needs to show something. Um, I think Brady hits. I think Beckham hits. Freeman, I think, does well. Gorkowski finds the end zone. But with bye week fill ins this early and you're at one and three, like, this is the worst feeling in the world. Um,. I think I think Rob Coffey will find some success. At least half of the roster will come out decent. The other half, I can't be so optimistic about. Go to Allen. Kirk Cousins at Baltimore. I really want to say that Kirk Cousins could have a good game, but I don't know. Like this Ravens defense, it's not good. It's v- much better than what it was last season. But I do think Kirk Cousins can still have potential to put up 22 points. So a lot of people are trying to figure out this San Diego wide receiver situation. This is like the fourth time now that I've called out Tyrell. I don't know if it, I'm calling out Tyrell Williams or the San Diego coaching staff. They don't take any deep shots with this guy. If he's 6'4", use his size. 
My problem with Tyrell Williams is if they're not taking deep shots with him downfield, that means that he's still a little underdeveloped in contested catches. Every Tyrell Williams catch or highlight that I see is a drag route over the middle of the field. Now, I think that's a that's that's good, but he needs to develop some more routes for me to ever like say that this is the guy. When you use that waiver claim on him, we all thought he was going to be the number one guy. By default, not a number one wide receiver, but I looked at the projections. It was like 10, 11, and now it's gone down to 8. And because Benjamin has return yardage duties, his projections really don't get affected that much. But this guy really needs to show me something or else I think he can either ride the bench for the rest of the season because I'm not confident. So ballsy move here, but I actually do agree with it. Golden Tate. Okay, speaking of a guy whose projections have went way down, and that's because he has not done anything. I actually think if Ebron is to sit out in this game, Philly's going to have to rely on Bolden and, and Tate. Uh, at this point, films are going to try to study ways how to take away Marvin Jones. And with the, the fact of the matter is, Theo Riddick has to be on the field more than what they wanted him to be used as. Somebody's got to step up. I actually like Bolden, and I actually like Golden Tate a lot this week. I do. Um, and when I say I mean like, not 20-point games, I actually think that both of them can get around like 8 to 10 without touchdowns. I'm not going to predict a touchdown for Golden Tate. I'd probably say that Bolden has a better chance, but he might get back on track. Jeremy Hill against Dallas. I don't know the Bengals situation, so like Tavon Austin, I can't predict anything for that. Matthew Jones against Baltimore. This is not a good matchup. I think this is a dud. Dennis Pitta. He hasn't done anything since week two. But I do think, target-wise, he might be number two on the team. It's either him or Wallace. We all know who number one is, but um, against the Washington Redskins, they haven't been terrible against uh, tight ends. I think they've actually been pretty good, so I don't like Pitta either in this matchup. Le'Veon Bell, I do like for obvious reasons. Bryce Butler, if Dez is out, fire him up. Fire him up. And Josh Lambeau is one of those kickers who's going to be projected at double-digit points. It was a great pickup move for a kicker. Um, I would have done it myself if I didn't have Nick Novak getting like 11 a week. But uh, Josh Lambeau certainly is like a consistent floor for, for a kicker because of San, San Diego. All right, my turn to pick a winner. Um, so I want to just – I know this is matchup-based – but I'm going to propose something to Allen right here. How bad do you want to win, Allen? Because you have Jamal Charles on a bye. And I know you're optimistic if you go 0-5 that you could, you think that you can still make the playoffs. And I'm all for optimism. I totally get it. But you got to get rid of him. Like, for something that you can plug in this week. Because this lineup, to me, there's a lot of wild cards in here. A lot. Um, and I do think with the lineup that you have set, I don't think it can handle the explosiveness with Tom Brady and Odell Beckham. I think those two alone, if, if you're, a lot of your guys don't hit, they can cancel out at least four people. And I, I, I'm not, I'm not big on coffee's flexes at all by any means, but I think Tom Brady out, out produces cousins by a lot. And I do think Beckham out produces, uh, Definitely two wide receivers. I don't know about three, but it, it'll come close. So for that alone, I think Coffee finds his second win of the season. All right. Um, so for this next matchup, um, we actually have a battle for first place. Um, we have one team who's leading the league in points scored but still finds themselves at 500. And another team who is 500, but is still trying to figure out how to deal with the injury bug. And first place is on the line in this matchup for rivalry, ladies and gentlemen. It is my team taking on the vintage one, Harsh Gardini. All right, so there's, there's a lot of question marks on Harsh's side of the ball with people who they're going to start. Uh, due to the injury fill-ins and, and bye weeks and, and all that stuff. So for this one, it's going to be very, very, very simplified on what the keys to victory for each team are. So before I get to my team, I'll go on the hard side of the ball. Now, the only guy here who's on a bye is Jeremy Macklin. But 
injuries have definitely set this team back a little bit. Julius Thomas is either hurt, so he's on a bye. So that means either Jack Doyle or Gary Barnage would have to fill in. I actually think that both of them will probably finish around the same points. I think Bar Barnage definitely has the potential to get more yards than Doyle. Doyle, you're just hoping for that touchdown. So it's whatever Harsh wants to do and how he's going to play it, I, I really don't know, to be honest. Um, the other situations here, David Johnson is, for this week, is the number one projected player for fantasy points and fantasy football for this week at 20, and I think that has to do with Drew Stanton. Now, a lot of people, like, this is an old narrative that I've completely thrown out the window since, like, my second year in, in playing fantasy football. If a starting running back's quarterback goes down, that, to me, is not a good thing. That means that defenses will probably key on the run. But needless to say, David Johnson is a phenomenal talent, and I get that. I, I He'll probably find the end zone, to be honest. He's just a great talent. The one thing, though, is what last time that the Cardinals had Drew Stanton filling in for Palmer, they wet the bed. They were only putting up like 14 points a week, 17 points with Drew Stanton at the helm. So it's just something to keep, keep an eye on. Um, I think his best matchup of the week here would definitely be Jarvis Landry against Tennessee. Um, Ryan Tannehill, uh, there was, I don't know if this is a rumor at all, something said that Jay Cutler was going to go to Miami. Now, I don't know if that's true. Now, if that is true with Adam Gase, I think Parker's value would skyrocket, but that's off topic. Right now, it's Ryan Tannehill going up against Tennessee. This guy is like the most consistent. I can't even say that. A lot of people view him as a wide receiver three, which I think is ridiculous. But in a .5 PPR, I think I think Landry is like an inconsistent floor two, or something like that. But this is definitely a game where he'll definitely find uh, some some decent maneuvering. I I can see like seven catches, sixty to eighty yards in a touch, something like that. So a solid day as, as a wide receiver two. Travis Benjamin's snap count went down last week and the previous week before, so I don't know if they want to treat him as a situational deep threat. He's also in the doghouse for fumbling, um, so I don't know. Now, a lot of people are more optimistic because of Inman, and some people still have not given up on Tyrell Williams. Um, Tyrell Williams, to me, is on life support at this point with, with my projections. Benjamin's role doesn't change, though, so you're trying to hope for him to go over the top in that one. Um, Demarius Thomas is an interesting guy to talk about because the true font factor is certainly in play. I don't know who that's going to be against, though. Is it going to be Demarius or Mr. Emmanuel Sanders? So I don't know. My guess is he's going to play it by the hot hand. So whoever is going to get the catches, that's who it's going to be. But I do think that Thomas and Sanders definitely have decent matchups. And a uh, sneaky pickup for defense is Philly. I could definitely see Stafford throwing like two picks in this game uh, and dial up the sacks definitely because they have no running game, so they're going to have to pass. So a very good pick up there. Oh, and I can't forget about the driving a fancy car. Yeah, I think that 25 projection is definitely warranted for Derek Carr. So that takes care of that. Um, my side of the ball. Now, um, we went out. Matt Stafford without a running game, and the, the, everybody's getting injured on Detroit. So I had to make a move. We have Ben Roethlisberger now leading my team. I like it, especially pairing him with Antonio Brown, and it is not a bad matchup against the New York Jets. I don't understand. I'm No, I don't like projections. But for some reason, Antonio Brown projections went down, and Ben Roethlisberger's are only sitting at 19. I do think that both of them outperformed that. Now, I'm not going to jump out of my way to be like, what the heck, Yahoo, da 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 Whatever. Um, there are only two wide receivers in the league right now, guys, that have more than 10-plus targets every single week. One of them is T.Y. Hilton. Um, by default, this is a, this is like Andrew Luck's go-to guy. It's in the dome. Colts offense, to me, seems to get a little bit better going at home, so I don't mind the matchup there. Melvin Gordon, I think, um, you know, he's just, consistent with the touchdowns i guess um at oakland this could be a game though where san diego while they will fall from behind san diego always keeps every game close so gordon should be a decent but again i am not i'm the type of guy who says to myself 
I view all my running backs as like RB twos. Howard is a nice a nice guy to have to have rostered, and especially against the matchup in Indianapolis. Um, so that's something to look forward to there. The only thing I don't know where I'm doing right now is that tight end. Um, news came out that Antonio Gates was practicing, and if Antonio Gates is to suit up, harsh, you're probably going to see Cameron break because I don't know what's going to happen with Hunter Henry. However, if Antonio Gates is ruled out, you will see your buddy Hunter Henry. So that takes care of that situation. Uh, the two flex spots, Marvin Jones to me is a... I think I would, I would put him as a boom or bust wide receiver one. The difference between a boomer bust wide receiver one and a boomer bust wide receiver two. Wide receiver two boomer bust, if they hit, they're like 17 points. But if they bust, it's something like four points. I think I think uh, Marvin Jones, you know, when he's not scoring, he's had 10, 15, and 9. That's without touchdowns. And when he scored, it was like a 35-point performance. So because of the volume and the targets that he gets, he is definitely warranted that uh label and for the first time this year i get to see myself starting steve smith due to doug baldwin being on a bye um i love steve smith i always have um i have him now when he's old but needless to say you know uh minnesota's defense should th this looks like it could be a big game for the vikings defense i thought last week was but the giants decided not to throw the ball which limited their upside it was ridiculous um so basically, the keys to victory here. For one, I think the quarterback needs the quarterback play needs to be there. Um, I have not won any games when my quarterback has not been over twenty plus points. Week one, Stafford had thirty four. Week three, he had thirty five. But that's why I made this change is because I need consistency. Um, so we have to do our part in that one. Um, I think that the targets will still be there for Hilton. Brown is Brown. Uh, the running backs, they have decent matchups. The tight end, I, I actually like Cameron Braid if he has to fill in, to be quite honest with you. Um, so I'm confident in what my guys can certainly do in this one. Um, and first place is on the line. So Okay, next matchup of the week. <laughs> hey, Burn. Your brain. So, considering that we have this matchup, if I win, you smoke me out for a month. If you win, you just smoke me out for a week. Cool? Fuck out of here. Alright, so, two players, rivalry week in the division. This is definitely the fight. In my opinion, this is the second place bout right here. Um, unless, unless the top dog in the league was to lose. But that's a slim chance. I think there's like a 20% chance of that happening and Brian's team exploding. Needless to say, let's break it down. Johnny versus Brian. I want to start with Brian's side of the ball first before we get to... <laughs> Alright. So, now, this is a different narrative for Brian due to the bye weeks coming in. But I want to talk a little bit about it. When I look at Brian's team... As a full roster with Allen Robinson in it, of course. He's a team that really needs the flexes to step up each and every week. Because due to the fact, now I know Terrence West had a great game. But we really have to see what happens when Kenneth Dixon comes into the mix. It was, it was phenomenal, but that was with just a four set, healthy scratch. Then find out we get he gets cut. And Buck Allen strictly used on third and longs. So he was the workhorse with nothing, but now we have Kenneth Dixon. So we'll see what happens there. But as of right now, the running back situation for Brian definitely is not the most appealing. We, I think he knows that as well. But he really needs these flexes to hit each and every week because that makes him feel a little bit better about what the running backs do. But I want to talk about the lineup we have set right now. Um, I'm not surprised that Trevor Simeon is a Brian quarterback. Um, other than Peyton Manning, Brian has done this before with Bronco QBs, a.k.a. Kyle Orton one year. He just loves Bronco quarterbacks if they're not named Peyton Manning. Um, Simeon against Atlanta. I don't know what to say about Trevor Simeon. I think the Broncos are at home. The defense should play well. I don't see this being a shootout game because of Matt Ryan's potential, but Simeon to me is like 
I, I don't know if we can make, make a premature narrative saying he's a quarterback one, but I, I don't feel comfortable doing that. I think if Simeon is quiet, it's like a 12-point game, but if he does something, it'll be like 21 points. So that's my prediction with Simeon. Will Fuller does not have a good matchup this week uh, for obvious reasons. Um, so I don't know about that. That's That's tough. It's just really hard whenever you go against the Denver Broncos and the Vikings. Like, I can't be optimistic on one guy specifically and say, yo, that's the guy who's going to do good. It's it's just a hard thing to do. But the fact of the matter is, now that he gets the bonus on return yards, bitch, um, I think that it's not a bad matchup. Um, I, I see something within, like, 9 to 10 for Fuller. I, I don't see him finding the end zone in this one because – I think Brock Osweiler just finds ways to just flat out lose this game and not put up touchdowns. Um, so I said the guy I really liked, really, really liked, and somebody that I was not big on in the beginning of the season due to the quarterback play, Emmanuel Sanders. Um, this is now going to be a guy who, if he steps up in this matchup, this is now a, a solid consistency. Solid, solid, solid consistency out of him ever since he's pulled that diva card. Um, and like I said, Antonio Brown did the same thing, so he learns from greatness. Um, I do see Sanders having a big game in this one, so that goes without a doubt. I, I'm not big on Theo Riddick against the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm just not. Uh, this this is a shame because now Zach Zenner has to lead the charge, which means that Theo Riddick is still going to be on the field for at least 90% of the time because the Lions won't be nursing the lead, and their play calling is going to be really bad against that defense. Um, Jordan Reed against Baltimore. Yeah, you can take a deep breath. He did good last week. Uh, I don't know how I'll do against the Baltimore Ravens, though, but needless to say, it is Jordan Reed. Give me a touchdown at least for him. Crowder against the Baltimore Ravens. I actually think that this is a great Deshaun Jackson game. I don't see this being much of a Crowder game if he does anything. Uh, and Delaney Walker against Miami is not a bad matchup at all. Um, but Walker has been quiet thus far. So the keys to victory for Brian. Well, the first thing is that your quarterback needs to hit. Um, you need Terrence West to still be that uh, lead back and that workhorse because the Redskins are a terrible run defense. They're, they're pretty bad. I think West needs uh, to hit at least 16 for Brian to feel confident because if he gets 10, I don't like Theo Riddick. And now if Theo Riddick does do good, that is subject to change. Um, it would be very nice if Will Fuller would do something, but that's hard to predict against the Minnesota defense. And I do think Sanders would have to um, continue his pace. So the MVPs for Brian this week, I'll say Trevor Simeon is going to be one just because it's quarterback points. Emmanuel Sanders will be another. I'll be a little bit optimistic with Terrence West. I'll say something maybe like 12 to 15 range, something around those lines. But Jordan, I think having Jordan Reed score a touchdown definitely, definitely would be a solid. And because he has the Denver Broncos, I'll talk about them a little bit. Um, they play, I, I think this is another big week for the Denver Broncos. I, I, for one, am not buying Matt Ryan carving up this defense at all. And I don't think that you st Matt Ryan is yet a quarterback one where you can just plug him in and he's matchup proof based or something like that. Now, I, I think there's a lot of sacks. Um, Julio Jones will be contained throughout this game. So the Broncos defense will be phenomenal yet again. Giants out of the ball. Um, Carson Wentz was a good pickup a, a week ago, a week ago, a week ago. All right, so Carson Wentz against the Detroit Lions. Um, I'll say at least two touchdowns for Carson Wentz in that one, so he's a good play. Um, speaking of other guys, Mike Evans, you got to like this pick and dial him up against the Carolina Panthers. Hell yeah, touchdown. Terrell Pryor, um, I don't know because I don't know what Belichick's game plan is. If, I'm, if Bill Belichick... He always likes these guys who can do everything, and something tells me he always is hypes up these people, so in the film room, he's probably like, Terrell Pryor will be one of the greatest wide receivers ever, and if you guys don't stop him, we're going to lose this game. So please cover Terrell Pryor and make sure that Andrew Hawkins beats us or some, something stupid like that. So I wouldn't be surprised if Terrell Pryor became a non-factor at all in this game. If he does have a good game, man, that's that's awesome. But I think Hugh Jackson needs to outsmart Bill Belichick for him to have a good game. And you can't outsmart Bill Belichick. That doesn't happen. Lamar Miller. Okay, he's an RB2. It's, 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 
point blank, he's an RB2. He's not an RB1, okay? So, and against the Minnesota Vikings, give me, like, 10 points for Lamar Miller. Okay, 11. 11, Johnny. I'll go 11. Oh, th- this this guy right here makes this team so much better than what it was in the beginning of the season. That's Ezekiel Elliott against us. Uh, I think Elliott finds the end zone yet again, and I think he has potential to put up 18 to 20. Uh, Tyler Eifert being hurt, though, does suck, though, because now you have to find somebody on the waiver wire, and I looked at the tight ends, man. Looks like you're going to be reunited with Dwayne Allen, because I don't see anything that would make me feel confident. I mean, the only other option, and that is if the banking on just a touchdown alone would be Richard Rodgers, but that's your call. Um, Julian Edelman against Cleveland is money. Uh, Randall Cobb against the New York Giants. I don't know, because he hasn't done anything. But if the Giants are susceptible against anything, it's over the middle of the field. The narrative has played itself. I'm not counting the Vikings because that's not an that's not an offense that does anything really. But Randall Cobb could be could be busy in this one. I'll say he bounces back in this game, but I still don't like him rest of the season. Um, all Arizona against San Francisco that could be dangerous as well. This matchup, I think, comes down to the, the pieces that are playing for Johnny and the ones that aren't for Brian. Due to the bye week blues, I gotta go with Johnny in this matchup. Real quickly on this next matchup, Andre, congratulations on uh, defeating me, going undefeated, taking on David. I'm really just gonna breeze by your team first and then analysis with David's because it's just there's not a lot to talk about. Like, I mean, there is in a good way, but you know what I'm saying. James Winston. 20, 20 plus in this matchup. Julio Jones, that's the only guy I really want to touch on on deep analysis and your flexes. So Julio Jones, great wide receiver, tough matchup. I'll say seven catches, 80 yards, and it's a coin flip with a touchdown because I do think that Denver will limit his explosiveness downfield. I think that defense is just too disciplined to have him just blow by him. Michael Crabtree finds the end zone yet again. DeMarco Murray might have potential for two touchdowns. The number one running back in fantasy football. I'm still jealous that you took him two picks before me because I knew Rep Carphy wasn't going to do it. But needless to say, great pick. And for some reason, when you have DeMarco Murray on your team, it's a match made in heaven. C.J. Anderson finds the end zone against Atlanta Falcons. That's a no-brainer. Greg Olson finds the end zone against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Vincent Jackson, that's a bi-week fill-in guy. I think he might get you two points. Eddie Royal... I do like. I think that was a great pickup to have your because you're gonna go by flex by committee at this point just to see what works and what doesn't. Eddie Royal could be a great PPR flex, and with the explosiveness that you have with Eddie Royal, yeah. Uh, Pittsburgh against the Jets. Fitzpatrick will gift them two picks, so I like that. I I just really like this team, and even with bye week fill-ins, he's got the perfect fill-in at QB. I, the flexes are the only mystery here, but now we got to go to David's side of the ball. Andrew Luck, um, well, <laughs> for the first three quarters, Luck might have eight points. And then fourth quarter comes, where did this 28-point uh, outburst come? It's going to be something like that. <sighs> if Palmer was in, I would like Fitzgerald. I think Fitzgerald is the safest Cardinal to start, though, with Drew Stanton. I'll say Fitzgerald finds the end zone, too, on Thursday night. DeAndre Hopkins against Minnesota. No, no, thank you. No, thank you. I, I, it's not not a good match. LeSean McCoy against Los Angeles. All right. So, I think McCoy, McCoy is a decent, decent floory RB1, meaning that he's limited with those 20-point outburst games that he used to have. I think he gets that 13-point projected there. Darren Sproles. Um... I traded him away only because I don't have any room to start him ever on my roster. But for this team, he's going to play that role pretty well for David's roster in the RB2 with stacked wideouts. Well, on paper, they're stacked wideouts. But uh, Darren Sproles, he's going to find... This defense is so bad. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Sproles found Pater. He still leads all Eagles backs and snaps because he has a role. <sighs> But if he doesn't score a touchdown, it's going to be like 7-9. to nine. But I'll be optimistic. I'm optimistic with Ertz as well. I think Carson Wentz really needs this guy to come back because he misses him. You can tell. Deshaun Jackson is money against the Baltimore Ravens. Devonta Parker against Tennessee. 
I like Landry this week, but I think Parker can also find some breathing room. There's a lot of pieces that I like for this team, but I think there's more explosion with Andre's team. So now I have to pick a victor. Um, I thought this was going to be a lot easier than I thought it would be to pick, pick a winner here. Andre's on a massive hot streak. Hot streak. He's the only team to put up 120 every single week. Um, I think I think it really comes down to honestly the RBs. I think I think that Andre's RBs are going to be so much better this week than David's running back situation because Murray and Anderson alone they might have enough volume to cancel out Vincent Jackson's two point performance that he's going to put up on Monday night. Um, and because if Devontae Parker doesn't score a touchdown, that means he's what he was last week, two to three points. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, Dan Bailey's questionable. That could be a, no. I'm just kidding. Uh, so it's now time for me to pick a victor. I don't like DeAndre Hopkins with Osweiler against the Minnesota Vikings, so I have to go with Andre. That's pretty much the game changer. Now time for the matchup of the week. It's the battle for first place. Breaking news, breaking news. The champ has been defeated. <laughs> I told you I'd kick your ass, man. That's probably what's going through the mind in his head right now. He is probably furious that he dropped. He lost that match. But champ looks to bounce back against Wig Champ Max. <laughs> Alright, let's get into it. Wow. All in on the Panthers as Derek Anderson might start at QB for Morris. And against Andy Dalton. I, I honestly think that Derek Anderson could outscore Andy Dalton anyway. Give me the advantage, Matt, there. We're doing classic matchup for this one. I feel like both of them like this format a little bit better. AJ Green versus Calvin Benjamin. This is actually going to be a draw here because I actually think that both of them could have big games. Both. Brandon Marshall against Jordy Nelson. I also think that both of these guys can have big games. But something tells me here that Jordy Nelson has two touchdown potential against the Giants. With two Norris Jenkins and no Rodgers Cromarty and no Eli Apple, possibly. Jordy Nelson's going to like run around circles with Janoris Jenkins. So I, I see two touchdowns. Um, da, 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 I know it's a bold prediction, but Jordy Nelson, I think at home, like always has potential to just go off. As long as he's healthy. Franco and Lacey, bitch, taking on Forte and Gurley. Matt Forte, is it, uh, you have to sell him immediately because um, not only because of Bilal Powell, but now this is the second injury that he has. He's 30 years old. I'm not liking it against a Pittsburgh run defense. They're good. The, Pittsburgh's defense is bad against backs that can catch the ball. I don't know that's Forte's repertoire, but a lot of third downs and shotgun formations, Bilal Powell. So I don't like Matt Forte in this matchup at all. If Frank Gore suits up against the Chicago Bears, it's going to be a classic Frank Gore game in his old age. 15 carries, 60 yards, touchdown. Lacey, bitch. I'm not a big Eddie Lacey guy, but I'm going to put him on the board for a touchdown in this one. And Todd Gurley, oh. Uh. I don't know how to predict Todd Gurley at all, to be honest. I, I don't know what to do with Todd Gurley, because if he doesn't find the end zone, you're looking at like eight points tops. Call, call, call me crazy, but I'm giving the RB advantage to Matt in this one. Kyle Rudolph, who's been very consistent for ending the end zone and shit, taking on Jason Witten. Uh, Witten's kind of been nothing since week one, really. You know what? I'll go with consistency with Kyle Rudolph if he's healthy. Okay, so this is where this matchup right now. Listen to the, this is the segment of this matchup where you want to listen to because this is the this is this right here. This right here, boys. This is what makes the flex matchups right now. This can make or break the matchup for both of these guys. On one end, you got the deep threat bomb that's just waiting to happen for two guys. On the other hand, you have consistent floor. This could really make or break. So, how do I uh, determine this shit, Nikki? Er, uh, yeah, let me get to that shit. 
Phil Dorsett and Ted Ginn. I'll start with them. If if one of these guys hits, man, it's like a 17-point week. You saw that against Dorsett last week. Well, it was like 12 points. But you guys get my drift. Dorsett against Chicago Bears. You would like to see a lot more targets with Dorsett, and I don't see that necessarily happening quite yet. And it's not necessarily because he's a bad receiver. It's just that Luck's not having time to throw the ball. Like, if you've noticed, a lot of T.Y. Hilton's damage has come across the middle of the field. Luck's not throwing bombs. But the one person who did get one is Philip Dorsett. So it's a matter of pass protection, not a matter of if he's a good player or not. And the Bears actually can dial up some pressure when they want to. But Luck is at home, so I think Dorsett catches a bomb. Ted getting against Tampa Bay. I And honestly, I know he lost. But Matt still put up a serviceable one. Uh, Matt, I'm sorry. I forgot what you put up. But it was pretty decent. It was like 130, 140, around that range. I, I'm sorry that I can't remember. But Ted Ginn could probably get a touchdown as well. But Jordan Matthews, I think, has, a, has one of those Jordan Matthews games where it's like 8 for 80 and a touch. And Shepard against the Green Bay Packers in a game where the Giants might be busy. I actually think if you guys like to bet on Vegas, take the over in New York against Green Bay. I actually think this is going to be a shootout. And I actually think that and while I do think Beckham is going to be the headline of this game, I think Shepard can get around 13 points. Seattle's on a bye, though. Oh, no. I don't know why you're starting Houston, Max. Um, Justin Tucker is actually very consistent as well. So, yada, yada, yada. Time to pick a winner for this one. So, when I look at it, um, if Derek Anderson is in, I think he actually has, like, mid-20s. But if Newton does suit up, that's a 30-plus point game waiting to happen. But it doesn't look like he is going to suit up. So I think that Anderson and Dalton actually cancel each other out because I don't like Andy Dalton that much as a starting quarterback. AJ Green. Eh. Brandon Mar- Well, no, that's a good thing. I mean, I don't know if he can outproduce Benjamin that much or Nelson that much, depending on. But like I said, it really comes down to the flexes in this one because I don't like the RB situation and the tight ends. You have to be optimistic with the flexes. So... I did say that Dorsett and Ginn were going to score a touchdown. The fact of the matter is this. Matt Matt could probably put in any defense. I don't think it matters if the deep threats hit. Because I'm not big on Max's RBs, and I actually think that both found the end zone for Matt. I predicted... I actually predict... To be honest, as weird as it sounds, Matt's whole team could get touchdowns. This could be a a big 140-plus week for Matt. I'm not optimistic with the RBs, though, to carry Maxwell. I'm really not. And because of that, even despite Jordy Nelson getting two touchdowns, and even despite Kelvin Benjamin finding the end zone in this one, it's going to be it's gonna be a tough, tough uh, matchup to beat. Needless to say, here's how I break it down. I, I, I'm, I'm, you sound like a broken record. All right, let me get Matt, because I do like the matchup for Ted Ginn. I do like the matchup for Philip Dorsett to take that bomb over the middle. I know Max has a consistent floor, but in order for Max, I think, to, to outproduce those flexes, Matthews would have to have a two-touchdown game or something like that. And that's a lot to ask for. So, ladies and gentlemen, give me Matt. And guys, stay tuned later on for the uh, special podcast. That's going to be a good one tonight.